um, unless uh, there is another important problem. I am going to start with the problem of the day, which happens to be a very interesting one. Um, again, last class we talked about last class we talked about quicksort. Any questions about quicksort? Why it is n log? Why the expectation of n log n is the right answer? Okay. Um, how the mechanics work? Any other questions about mysterious properties we may not have discovered, discussed so much? Any questions about quicksort? Okay, hearing nothing, let's talk about the nuts and bolts problem. The nuts and bolts problem says that you are given a collection of n nuts and n bolts. Now, what is a nut? Okay, a nut you've probably seen, if you've seen any hardware score, it looks something like this. It has uh, screw threads in there, and a bolt looks something like this. And each nut screw, each bolt has a nut that is designed to screw into it. And it's kind of a, a, a fastening thing. So, um, if you have the right size nut, fits on the right size bolt. And if you have a small, a nut that is too, has too small a hole, you put a bolt on it, it doesn't go in. Okay? If you have a nut that is too big a hole for a bolt, it doesn't stick. It just goes in and it isn't a tight thing. When you have the right size nut and bolt, the screw threads match and they pair up. This problem says, I'm giving you a pile of n nuts, each of which are of a different size, and I'm giving you n bolts, each of which are of different size. And your job is to pair each, find for each nut the corresponding bolt. And the only way you can test whether a nut fits a bolt is to try them together. Either they will screw into each other because they're the same size, or it will reject because it is too, 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 the nut is too small, or it will reject because the nut is too big. Okay? And now your job is to efficiently uh, tell, connect the nuts with the bolts. Okay? The interesting thing here is that the connections between the the differences in size between nuts and smolts, bolts are too, so small that you can't really compare them by eye. All you can do is try a nut against a bolt and see what happens. Okay. Any questions? Um, I had a question. Yes. Are we allowed to assume that the smallest bolt will correspond with the smallest nut and so yes. on? So in fact, we'll assume that every nut for every bolt, there is a one corresponding nut, and for every nut, there is one corresponding bolt. Okay? So what do I ask you to do? First, give me an n squared algorithm to solve the nuts and bolts problem. Can anybody give me an n squared worst case algorithm to solve the nuts and bolts problem? Um, one way to go about it is taking a nut and then comparing it with every other um, bolt until you get a match. Try every nut, take, take the first nut, try it against every bolt, okay? The moment I have, a, 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 they, they perfectly fit, then I, I screw them together and put it aside. The claim is that after I've done N comparisons, I will have matched my nut with the right bolt. And if I then repeat again with what remains after n minus one comparisons, I will get a second bolt, n minus two. Basically, after n steps, each of which requires at most n comparisons, I will pair off my nuts and bolts. That is why this takes n squared time. Any questions about that? Okay, now, um, try, what if I wanna just find what the smallest nut and the smallest bolt is, okay? How can we identify what the smallest nut and the, its, its match is, okay? Using only two N comparisons. 
Um, we can just scan the nuts list and the bolts list and looking for the minimum in both and match those. Okay, so you say look for the minimum in both. I don't understand this because minimum would seem to be if I'm comparing a nut against a nut and figuring out which one is smaller. But I can't compare a nut against a nut. How do you compare a nut against a nut? It just, you know, I don't see what's happening. I can compare nuts against bolts, but not nuts against nuts. Okay. So how do I go and find a minimum? Uh, so, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so what we could do is we would start off by taking an arbitrary nut, and then we take an arbitrary bolt, and we compare them, right? And this will reduce, this will give us, you know, it'll, if they're equal, then we do one thing. But if, in most cases, it should be that one of them is less or one of them is greater. So what we do is we take whichever one is bigger. So if the nut is too big, then yeah. we discard the nut and we keep the bolt. If the bolt is too big, then we discard the bolt and we keep the nut and we move on to the next one. Now, if they are equal, what we do is we hold on to both of them for now, we set them aside, and we grab the next nut. When we grab the next nut, if this next nut is bigger than the previous bolt, then we discard that nut and we grab the next nut after that. But if this next nut that we grabbed is smaller than the last bolt, then we get rid of both the bolt and the nut that we saved. Right. Okay. We keep doing so, this until we get to so the So we end. agree that there's, again, I, that's a, as far as I'm concerned, a perfectly good answer. Um, there is some finesse as was discussed about when, when, you, when the nuts match. But otherwise, when you compare a nut against a bolt, you know which one is bigger. You can throw out the bigger one because you're only interested in the smallest. And the claim is you have two n things. If in each comparison you throw out one of them, okay, then after two n minus two comparisons, you will be left with two of them which must be a nut and a bolt, and they both have to be the smallest ones, okay? So I understand that now. Any questions about this? It should, the, the, the basic idea of why it's 2n minus 2 should be clear. There's some level of detail in getting it right in the case of equality, but what he said sounded pretty good to me. Any questions? Okay, the last question is the interesting one. How do I match the nuts and the bolts in n log n comparisons in expectation? Okay, does anybody have any ideas? Okay. Uh, you could potentially, you start with a nut. And we do the same thing as we did before, a similar thing as we did before. We start with a nut, and then we run through the uh, the bolts until we find a uh, And then we take all of the ones that are bigger, and we put them in a pile. We take all the ones that are smaller and put them in a pile, and then we match so the ones. this is less than the nut. nut. There's going to be one bolt that's the size of the nut, and there's a bunch of other bolts that are bigger than the nut. Does everybody agree that if I start with one nut, and I do a n comparisons, I can partition the things into ones that are less than the nut, greater than the nut, and equal to the nut. Okay. What next? Uh, then you do the same thing, except you use the matching bowl with the nuts so that you can okay, get... So, so now, what we want to do, now what you're going to say is you're going to take this bolt which is the one that matched this nut. And now you're going to partition the nuts. And there's going to be the nuts that are less than this bolt and the nuts that are greater than this bolt. How many comparisons will that take? N, again. N, okay. Now that I've got that happening, what do I do? You do the same thing with the uh, partitions. You say you want to recursively deal with it by now noticing that all the all of these guys are of size less than that nut. All of these are of size less than the corresponding bolt. So 
these, all the pairings are going to be within this. I can solve this problem recursively. I can solve the problem recursively on the big nuts and the big bolts. Does everybody see that? What algorithm does this smell like? Quicksort. Quicksort, okay. So this is exactly the same analysis as quicksort. I am spending order n time or order n steps to do a partitioning. I have redu produced a thing where the left side, the small stuff is on the left side, the big stuff is on the right side. I've got two recursive problem, two smaller problems, both with the, exactly the, the nuts and bolts for them. This should take exactly the same amount of time that quicksort does in expectation, which is why it is n log n. Any questions about that? Now, suppose I was to ask you to try to do this deterministically. What if I said I want a worst case n log n way of doing it? Okay. What's interesting in this problem is I can't tell you a worst case n log n way of doing it. Okay. That, that this, is a, this is one of these cases that kind of show kind of how magical randomization kind of is. Okay. That this is a pretty a very simple randomized algorithm for this kind of a problem. But without doing things that kind of fake randomization using high power algorithmic -y things that we're certainly not going to talk about. There is no known fast way, easy way to do this, the way there are other sorting problems deterministically. When you make a random choice, usually it's going to be a good one or good enough one that you will always make progress and that's why quicksort was good. But somehow trying to do something like this deterministically, okay, turns out to be a much harder problem. That's why we like to say that thinking about these things random, with randomness can lead to simple algorithms where otherwise you don't have them. Any questions about quicksort or nuts or bolts? Oh, um, I have a question. Yes. Um, with the second part, um, we don't have to mention like a data structure we'd be using to do those comparisons on. So in this case, the um, note that in a problem like this, there, it isn't a computer problem. This is a hardware store problem, right? So the, um, what is the data structure that's going to contain the nuts and bolts? It is a data structure called a pile. Okay, is everybody familiar with a pile? Okay, they sort of look like that. Okay, and that that's the right data structure in this case. In this case, we're kind of stretching it out on a table. Okay, there isn't a, you know, there's a computer idea, an algorithmic idea, but this is not really one where there's a data structure issue here. Okay, the data structure is sort of a table and piles. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about quicksort or nuts or bolts? Okay. Um, what I'd like to show you quickly is um, a couple of other ideas related to sorting. Hopefully, Again, it's important you understand why merge sort is n log n. It's important you understand why heap sort is n log n. It's important you understand why, um, what you call it, uh, quick sort is expected n log n. Um, one question that, that, that's a fair question to ask maybe is might there be a faster algorithm than n log n? And, um, you know, I will tell you, I don't know a faster algorithm that, that, than, that's faster in the worst case or expected case in, any, in the models that we talk about than n log n. But how do we know that, in fact, there's no way that you can do better than n log n? Um, 
there are very few algorithmic problems where, um, so I'm hearing some, some wise guys saying, um, what about counting sort, okay? Well, that sort of assumes something about if you're counting things, maybe you, you, you're, you're assuming you've got numbers, okay? And you're assuming properties of numbers, okay? If I'm giving you n names to sort, okay, and you're allowed to compare these things, it's not clear to me that, um, that you can, can do some of these tricks that you might think of, okay, and I want to, in fact, spend the lecture talking a little bit about these tricks to kind of sort of show you why they, 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 they can't work, okay, in a world where you've got arbitrary keys, not integers that satisfy some nice property, okay but that whenever you're sorting uh, arbitrary keys n log n comparisons is the is the best you can do okay let me argue why this why this is and um it turns out that 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 um that if we think about all the sorts that we have so far all of them are what we would call comparison based Operationally, what you are doing is taking um, two elements and saying, of these two elements, A and B, which one of them is, for, is ahead of the other in alphabetical order? Is, should this go before that or should this go before that? Um, that's what we mean by a comparison program, sort program. Now, um, if we think about it, if we have a program that is going to sort, okay, um, on, uh, you know, any input of n items, anytime I run it with the same input, it has to do, go through and do the exact same thing inside. But anytime I run it on two different permutations, it's got to kind of do something different. Remember, the job is going to be to take your input and rearrange it. It can't be the case that I take two different inputs with two different perm from two different input permutations and have the program do the exact same set of rearrangements and the exact same sequence of comparisons. Because if so, they would do, you know, it would rearrange them in the same way, one of which would have to be wrong. Okay, so we live in a world where we can think of any sorting algorithm that's based on comparisons of pairwise elements as looking something like a tree. What is this tree like? Well, let's say the input of this is a, a tree talking about how do we uh, sort the elements A1, A2, A3. The first thing we might do is compare is A1 bigger than A2, okay, less than A2. If it is, we're going to go down this branch. If we know that then test if A2 is um, less than A3, that meant that the three elements had to be in sorted order to start with, okay? And in that case, there was no rearranging done. If, on the other hand, we know that A1, A2 is bigger than A1, A3 is also bigger than A1, and A2 is bigger than A3, basically we know that A1 is bigger than A2, and A2 is less, uh, you know, A1 is less than A2, and A2 is less than A3, that meant that the elements were in reverse order and we would have to swap them accordingly. What I want to convince you is that any sorting algorithm, okay, can be thought of as a tree of comparisons, where which elements we test are going to depend upon what were the results of the previous comparisons we did. Any questions? Can anybody tell what algorithm this is. I have a tree here 
Is this anyone, is there any, can anyone tell me what algorithm this is? You guys know about sorting algorithms. I claim this is insertion sort, actually. What do you do on insertion sort? Do you first tell whether A1 is, a, is less than A2? And then um, what you call it, swap, the, then if, if, if they are, swap them? Then you're going to compare A, regardless of whether it was or was not, you're now going to compare A3 to the bigger of those two, right? And then decide whether it is bigger or smaller than the previous element. And then if it slid forward, if it, if it didn't slide, then you knew that it, the third element had to be at the end as the biggest overall. If not, then you had to decide whether this A3 is going to become the first or second or element in sorted order. Okay? And uh, that's what this is doing here. Any questions? Do people see how I can think of insertion sort as this tree? And any um, data, any sorting algorithm that works by comparisons as this tree of comparisons? Any questions? Well, if you believe that, then what is the complexity of sorting on this algorithm? If you want to analyze it, the complexity, the worst case time, is the height of this tree. The most number of comparisons we did was three. Kabunk, kabunk, right? So the question now reduces to, what do we know? We know any sorting algorithm is defined by a tree where the leaves are going to be input permutations. Okay, the internal nodes are comparisons, and the height of the tree is the longest running time of the algorithm. How many leaves are there going to be if we have an n element sorting problem? How many leaves do we get? Anybody tell? I'm seeing an n factorial. Well, every possible input is eventually going to be sorted. Every possible input represents some path through this tree. Okay. So yes, we live in a world where we've got a tree that is has n factorial leaves. Okay. Any questions about that? Now, what do we know? We know that there must be n factorial leaves. We know that this comparison of true and false is a binary tree. What is the minimum height tree that we have? If that, what is the minimum height such that we have n factorial leaves? Can anybody tell me? If you have a binary tree with n factorial leaves, what is the minimum height going to be? The shortest possible height of any tree with that. I am seeing the log of n factorial. Isn't that right? Because again, the number of possible leaves doubles every time we increase one, add one to the height of the tree. We want to know how many doublings till we get from one to n factorial. So what is the log of n factorial? Does anybody know? Okay. Well, that's a little bit tricky here. Let's try a couple of other things. I claim that n factorial is less than n to the n. Okay, my writing is bad now. Can anyone tell me why n factorial, this is an exclamation point, why is n factorial less than n to the n? Can anyone uh, tell me why? It's because for the n factorial, we have to like keep multiplying it by n minus one, n minus two, but then for n, the, n, the, n to the n, we have to like multiply n, n times. Right, what is n to the n? It's n, n, 
n n n dot the product of n of them right actually you guys get to see this or uh funny i can't put this in here yeah we can, what is we n can factorial see it. one times two times three dot 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 up to n does everybody agree that the product of n ends is going to be bigger than the product of um one through n okay what is the log of n to the n does anybody know n how do you compute the log of n to the n, n log n isn't it that you take the exponent and you bring it down and then take the log of the other thing that's going to be n times log n okay so this told tells me that um but that's an upper bound on it what if let's say i just take um if i think about n factorial is my favorite way of counting i claim that if i think about n factorial let's say i ignore the first n over two terms what if i multiply it by n over 2 n over 2 n over 2 suppose i think of n over 2 n over 2s is the product of that going to be less than n factorial well suppose i multiply the first n over 2 terms of n factorial or one times two times three times dot 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 up to n over two i'm going to replace that with one clearly this part is bigger than all ones now this part of n factorial goes from n over two to n the product of that is going to be um what you call it uh the product of that is going to be bigger than n over 2 to the n over 2. Do you see why? Okay. The product of n factorial is, the, is n numbers that range from 1 to n. This product is going to be n over 2 numbers that range, have the value of exactly n over 2. It should be clear that n over 2 raised to the n over 2 is less than n factorial do people agree with that do people see where my reasoning is okay n factorial is the product of n numbers i'm going to make now this is now the product of n over 2 numbers all of which are less than the, the n over two biggest components of n factorial what's good about that what is the log of n over two raised to the n over two does anyone know what the log of that is what is the log of a raised to the b does every anybody know what that is uh, b log a that is b log a so here b plays n over 2 a plays n over 2 this is going to be n over 2 log n over 2 and does everybody agree that n over 2 divided by log multiplied by log of n over 2 is theta of n log n any questions about that so this says that the shortest possible tree with n factorial leaves is going to have to be bigger than this and this is of course theta of n log n so what I've proven is that there's no um, way of doing this sorting, okay, faster than n log n, if I have an algorithm that works on comparisons. How many people sort of see that? 
or are there any questions? A question is always a good thing. Okay. So in fact, there is no way to sort better than n log n. And again, there's other ways of doing this same kind of thing if you happen to know about Sterling's approximation for n, that a better approximation for n log n, n factorial, is n over e to the n, but, but that don't worry about it. Any questions? So the good thing is that, um, what you call it, that uh, n, um, what you call it, that, uh, that if I have a comparison sort, there's no way to do it better than n log n. But there are some weasel words going on. What does it mean if I'm limiting you to comparison sort? Maybe there are ways of um, what sorting that don't involve taking pairs of elements and comparing them. Some people on the chat are rambling on about counting sort. What is counting sort? Does anyone want to tell me what counting sort is? Someone, does anyone have an idea what counting sort is? Doesn't make you a bad person, makes you a good person. Is there anybody who wants to admit it? I'm gonna take a guess where we just count every um, element and if it's, um, if we've seen it before, we just increment a counter um, for okay. like that bucket per se. So one idea would be, what if we, if we've seen it before, we keep count of how many times it occurred and then um, if we had our, basically, I think what you're saying is something like, suppose I ha know my numbers run from one to K, okay? One possibility is to set up sort of almost like a hash table without the hashing, an array of K buckets. And if I knew my numbers that I wanted to sort were integers from one to K, what am I going to do? 17, 32, 15, hike, okay? What am I going to do when I see a 17? I increment the 17th bucket. When I see a 32, I increment the 32nd bucket. When I imp implement a 14, 15, I increment the 15th bucket. If I see it another time, I keep turn that count to 2, 3, 17, whatever it is. Now, what am I going to do? Once I have the counts, an array of counts from 1 to K, maybe what I should do is go from left to right. This is 0. Uh-oh, uh that's bad. Ah, look, that's great. Look, I fixed that. No, no. Uh oh. Okay, I got a problem here. Okay. I go four I goes from one to K. Increment um what you call it. If it's zero, do nothing. If it's greater than zero, if it's one, print out if the ith bucket is has has a, a one print out i once if i bucket has two print it out twice in general print out a sub i to i a sub i times and that would print out the numbers in sorted order does everybody kind of get that idea if i knew the numbers were integers from one to k i could spend order k time initializing this data structure so the counts were all zero then for i goes from zero to n i could go through and um what you call it and uh increment the counters of the ith element and then as i go from left to right for i goes from one to k print out the appropriate number of numbers that's going to be also order n. Uh oh, trouble. This would be an order n plus k algorithm. 
Any questions about why counting sort by this measure is n plus k? Why doesn't this break my, my lower bound? Okay. Doesn't compare. Because what? Because it doesn't compare. But, you know, just because I don't do it something, okay, doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't, um, it's linear, it seems. But is this general sorting? Um, I'm going to say no, because we know um, our elements are finite from 1 to k. Does everybody see that you've got integers from 1 to k? Okay. In general, you want to sort people's names. Okay. If I had a bucket here for every possible name that someone could have, then what would happen? Well, it's going to be expensive to, you know, that's going to be a lot of buckets, right? K would be almost infinite. And I would have to figure out what bucket it is that a name goes to. That might require something like binary search. Binary search is a logarithmic like thing, right? If I have to do n binary searches to figure out where to put my item, that starts to look like an n log n algorithm, doesn't it? Okay. So there are non comparison sort ideas that look cute, okay? But recognize that fundamentally, they are either making assumptions about the distribution of the numbers, okay, or they are limiting the um, range of keys that you can have. A, a, a kind of fake sorting out, not fake, but uh, let's say special purpose sorting algorithm that I like better than um, counting sort was bucket sort. What if I am sorting again n numbers, each of which lies from 1 to m, where m might be a big range, okay? Let's say that um, I, uh, uh, I know that my numbers are approximately uniformly distributed in this interval. Then I could set up n buckets where each bucket is responsible for n m over n numbers. Remember, I'm going to have n buckets. n times m over n is m. So I'm going to divide the range of numbers from 1 to m into n equal size buckets. Then I've got n buckets and I'm going to stick in n numbers. So on average, Every number is going to be, um, what you call it, uh, every bucket will have one element in it. The buckets are ordered naturally in increasing order. Okay, so all the elements in here are bigger than any of the elements in here. So if I sort each bucket, okay, if I sort the elements that fall in the first bucket and print them out, and then sort the elements in the second bucket and print them out. Dot, 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 nothing. Print these, print these, print these. <clears throat> the array is going to be sorted. Does everybody kind of get that idea? All the integers got hashed in some sense to bucket, into buckets based on um, dividing the integer by my m over n factor to figure out what bucket it goes into. Um, if the items are uniformly distributed, then we would expect that every bucket contains about a, uh, you know, a constant number of elements. If it contains a constant number of elements, you can do whatever sort, and you will get that, it will take constant amount of time. Does everybody see how this bucket sort looks like it should take order n time to throw the items into buckets, a constant amount of time to sort a small number of items in each bucket, and then order n time to, um, what you call it, to toss uh, 
you know, to actually print the items out, okay? Is count, is this bucket sort gonna be order N? Do people see why I think bucket sort kind of looks, looks like it's order N? Any questions? What are the catch? Why doesn't this break my lower bound? Why isn't this real? Isn't there something kind of fishy going on? What are the weasel words that I used in this sorting algorithm? Okay. The question is, does it take too much space? No. This is a total of N buckets. I've got N buckets. Each bucket is a linked list. This is gonna take order N space, no problem. Okay. Um, okay, what other things do I see as we, do I need the min and max values? Well, I've told you the numbers lie between one to M, but M could be a very big number, right? That doesn't scare me. What does scare me is this word uniform distribution. Okay. If in fact you know that the keys are going to be given to you uniformly within a range, then this kind of a hashing scheme is going to do just fine. But note that unlike building a hash table, we're kind of relying, we're not actually scrambling the keys up. A good hashing function is going to scramble the keys up. We are simply going to divide by them and keep the keys in buckets based on their numerical order. If you give me keys that are not uniformly distributed, bad things can happen. Okay. Again, this was saying what happened with why uh, it looked like bucket sort was order n. But what happens? Suppose all the keys, the keys could range from 1 to M. What if all the keys happen to fall in the bucket corresponding to the smallest numbers? Now you spent order N time. And in your partitioning, you learn nothing. Now you have a linked list of N items still to sort. How much time will it take to sort that? Well, you know, it depends what sorting algorithm you use, but you've made no progress after n time. Does everybody kind of get that idea? Bucket sort relied on you making a claim that the keys were uniformly distributed that they gave it to you. If someone comes to me and says, hey, here are some uniformly distributed keys, trust me. Do I trust them? I don't trust anybody, okay? Not when they're giving me these things, okay? It could very well be that your distribution has a, a skew to it and all the elements lie in some other kind of funny place and might end up in the same bucket. We're not gonna be able to fix this by changing the hash function the way that you could do with hashing. With hashing, if you pick a different hash function, if the first hash function did badly, odds are a second hash function is going to do just fine. Here, I need the keys to appear in the order, in buckets, the, the buckets to be ordered, okay, in the order you want the output, okay? Any questions? So the lesson here is this is why we worry about worst case performance and why we don't like to assume anything about distributions. We like to say, you give me an arbitrary set of input and I'm gonna deal with it and it's always gonna be good no matter what input you give me. If I use a randomized algorithm, I don't wanna say, well, if you give me something good, I'll be okay. I want it to be, I'm gonna flip coins and unless I am unlucky enough to get hit by lightning, everything's going to be okay. Notice with quicksort, you had a randomized thing. There was nothing in the input, okay, that they could do 
to hurt you, okay? If you were picking their pivot randomly. In an algorithm like this, you're assuming, praying that they're not giving you the, the, the data in a way that all the items lie in the same bucket. Does everybody kind of get the difference between this? It's kind of a subtle point, but it's an important point. Any questions? Okay. And I want to show you um, a real life case where um, distributions that you think you understand the distribution of how things are ordered isn't necessarily right. Um, if you look at uh, a phone book, or you look at, let's say, all the people in the world, Let's say think about Manhattan. Manhattan has several million people that live in it. How many people in Manhattan have the last name of Skeena? Is it a lot or a little? Okay, who here thinks it's a lot? Okay, well, I, I appreciate your faith if you think it's a lot. Who here thinks it's a little? Okay, there happened to be, when last I checked, 16 Skeenas in the world. Okay, of whom I believe two of two or three of us live in Manhattan. Okay, fine. How many Smiths are there in Manhattan? A lot or a little? I'm hearing a lot. Okay. How many Shiflets are there in Manhattan? Has anybody ever met a guy named Shiflet? Okay. Has anybody in this class ever met someone whose last name was Shiflet? No. Well, turns out that our new president at Stony Brook, McGinnis, and I both have the distinction of having been undergraduates at the University of Virginia. Not together. I, I, I didn't know her. I never, never actually met her yet. But uh, she was also at the University of Virginia. And that's in a town called Charlottesville, which is a town of about 50,000 people. And this is a section of the Charlottesville phone book, okay, that had about 50 pages when I was a grad, an undergrad there. What do you notice? You notice an incredible number of shiftlets, okay? There is a Deborah shiftlet, a Delma, a Delmas, a Dempsey, Denise shiftlet, Dennis, two Dennises, two Deweys. Why are there so many shiftlets in Charlottesville, okay? And it turned out historically that uh, there was, the story I heard was that there were two families that were feuding with each other and the government stepped in and moved one of the families to West Virginia and Charlottesville got the shiftlets, okay? But the net result is that name distributions and other data is not necessarily uniformly distributed. And if you tried to do bucket sort on the Charlottesville phone book, Based on letter, what would you find? Everybody, a, a huge chunk of people are in the S bucket. Maybe you now refine it, and you'll find that all those S's are now going to the H bucket. And all of the H bucket, you then refine it, you're going to the I bucket. Does everybody see that you, you are not going to make any progress because the names are not well distributed? The reason we like algorithms that do well in the worst case is we don't want to worry about strange distributions of data and that like, like the shiftlets of Charlottesville. Any questions? I see a question, somebody's hand up. Okay, any questions? Okay, I see the hand went down. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so that's why we're going to worry about worst case sorting algorithms, okay? And basically, when you start playing around with these, um, well, if I want my keys to be distinct, I can't bucket them properly. Um, uh, all the buckets are going to have duplicates until the keys get to be sized log n. Once they are log n, then maybe you've got all the keys are going to be distinct. And then um, what you call it? And then you know you, you know you have to do binary searches, 
Bottom line, sorting takes n log n time, okay? And it's an example of one of the few algorithm problems where we can actually prove that there's no faster algorithm for it, okay? Any questions about that? Any questions of anything having to do with sorting? Nothing. Any questions of anything having to do with the midterm, which we agree is going to be on uh, Thursday at three o'clock, being taken over the, uh, you know, respond this browser and that you're gonna do it the exact way you did a test. And if you haven't done the, the test exam, then darn it, you should do it. Any questions? I have a quick question. Um, can you just go over why heap sort is more like um, is like a quick sort algorithm in heaps instead of I don't know when I was reading through the textbook it seemed more like a merge sort like it, I like kind of like thought of it more as merge sort. Okay, wait. So say again what your question is. Um, like I guess can you just like quickly explain why heap sort is um like how heap sort and quick sort relate to each other? Okay. How do they relate to each other? They both do the same job. It's the same way that I relate to your English professor. We both do the same job. We teach, we, uh, we do research, okay? The ideas behind the sorting algorithms are different. And again, it's important. I think that that's the important way to think about these sorting algorithms. The important idea of quicksort was that it was a randomized algorithm. That is what, uh, let's make it red. For quicksort, we had this great idea that if we picked something at random, we could break it into two pieces. <clears throat> and by picking it at random, okay, we were probably not going to end up with bad um, on average. It's very, very hard to repeatedly get unlucky. And usually, when we pick an element that's going to lie kind of sort of towards, you know, more, you know, towards the middle or towards middle enough that it's going to help us make progress. And if at every step we carve off a constant fraction, well, we get a, a tree that is of height log n, and we spent order n time per, per row, okay? This was going to be an n log n. So quicksort was about random. Ran, quicksort was about randomization. There's now this question about what is merge sort about. Merge sort is I'm going to explicitly partition the list into two things, and then merge them after it's sorted. So I am going to end up with a beautifully balanced tray at all times. Actually, what did I do here? Yeah, this was two. Now it's four. Now it's eight. How did I want to do this, right? Boom, 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 boom. I guess I needed a one up there. So merge sort was a great example of a divide and conquer algorithm. We divided the problem into two halves, okay, and sorted them recursively, and then put the two things together, okay, by just doing a merge operation. Once they were sorted, we could do the merge in time linear, linear in the number of elements, okay? And that was the idea behind merge sort. Heap sort, was a different kind of an idea. Heap, heap sort is, as far as I'm concerned, a data structure idea. We built a heap with the property that the elements in them had better be organized in a way that every element is bigger than its descendants. Okay. And we saw that we could build this heap ordered tree in a way that it was perfectly balanced because we were going to store the elements basically in an array and fill them in without pointers 
as we went along. First element, second element, third element, new row. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, new row. Seventh, eighth, dot, dot, dot. Okay? We had this property that we could insert a new item into the heap. Okay? And it was going to, um, we could bubble it up. Okay? Till we found the spot where it belonged. Where it took at most a, a, lo, a, con, a logarithmic number of steps to get up to the right place. So we could build this heap in n log n time. And the smallest element had to be here. If we wanted to sort, we could take this, the root element, which was the smallest, print it out, then replace it with the last element in the heap was probably going to be a big one, 56. And then slide it down in constant time per level to figure out where it actually ended so I could restore the heapness. And if I could do that in the logarithmic time per element, if I do that n times, that tells me that I can restore the heap in log n time after n steps of Find the minimum in constant time, delete it, and restore the heap in log n time. That would be n times log n. Heap sort was an example of using a good data structure, a very useful data structure, a priority queue, to build these things. So the interesting thing is that, uh, what you call it, that all these three algorithms work with different algorithmic ideas. Sometimes you find fast algorithms by finding a good data structure. Sometimes you find a, a good algorithm by doing a divide and conquer, perfectly splitting things up equally, solving the problems and putting them together. And sometimes we do it by randomization. Okay, and the act of algorithm design, the art of algorithm design is figuring which ones of these, what is the right way to do these things. Any other questions? That was a kind of a big speech here, but what, what, any other questions? Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, how is the number of comparisons for merging two halves uh, as it goes to go down? Okay, what was the idea in merge sort? Well, let me start out with, uh, let me make this blue here. What is the important point? To go from two halves that were sorted. Here I had n over two elements. Here I had n over two elements. Merging those two sorted lists took a total of n minus one element comparisons. Here I have two things with n over four. Merging them together took n over two steps. Here I had two things that were n over four and n over four. Merging them took n over two steps. Two times n over two was uh, actually, if you need to know, it's basically, uh, it's really two times n over two minus one. But again, this is still going to be n-ish. Okay, n-ish. If you count the total cost of these mergings, at every layer we double the number of pieces. At every layer, layer we have the number of elements in each merge. Okay? So the total amount of work that got done was the same thing. Okay? And so we had a world where there was a tree of height log n where the amount of merging that was done at each level of the tree was linear, okay? And that's where the n log n came from. Any other ideas, questions here? And again, I like when people say things. I don't like to read things during class. Any questions? Any other questions about any homework 